Hello everybody, and welcome to my talk, Beyond the Borders of Scope, Finding Bugs in InScope Applications Using Autoscope Targets. First off, I'd like, I'd like to thank HackerOne and Ben for hosting this awesome virtual conference, and thank you for having me. So who am I? Hi, my name is Jasmine Landry. Yes, I know it sounds like a girl's name, but I'm French-Canadian, and we pronounce it as Jasmine, which is completely normal and not weird. I'm also known as JRock17 in the bug bounty community. I'm sort of a sort of, of a full-time bug bounty hunter since I officially work a few days per month only, meaning I spend more time doing bug bounty than actual work. And yeah, as most Canadians, I love hockey. To start this off, I'm going to talk about how I approach an application when I start hacking, how using autoscope assets can result in impactful bugs in the program's core assets, and lastly, I'll show a few examples of bugs I found. Unfortunately, I must redact most of the details, however, I can still show you guys the techniques I've used. Quick disclaimer, this talk is not about hacking autoscope targets, it's simply about gathering information from autoscope targets in order to help you find bugs in InScope applications. Don't do actual hacking on autoscope applications. If you do, I'm not responsible for your actions. So how do I approach a new target? I try to figure out what's the app's purpose and what kind of bug would be the most impactful for their business. Does the program have a focus area or do they offer bonuses on specific assets or bug types? If they do, then they must care about it, so I would focus on those. From here, I'm approaching it as if it were CTF. Ironically, I don't even like CTFs and I suck at them. But anyways, so I create myself a fake flag based off of the application's purpose and or focus area and bonuses. If the program's focus area is authentication and they reward bonuses for auth-related bugs, then the flag I'm creating myself is finding an account takeover. I'll do what it takes to get it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Or if the app is built on PHP, then it's RCE or nothing. After giving myself a goal, I try to think of what other hackers might have missed on this, on this application and what they didn't think of trying. That's where browsing around the application as a regular user would comes in handy. You get to understand the application's logic, and also you get to see what technologies are used, how pieces are put together, so on and so forth. From here on, it's practically just trying to find bugs and get some bounties. Again, follow the program's rules and don't hack on autoscope targets without permission. But that doesn't mean we can't do passive recon on those targets. It might not even be targets that's in the, in the autoscope section of the program. It could actually be assets that you see interacting with the application you're trying to hack. For example, that means that are listed in the content security policy. Why are they there and what's the relation between them and the target? Who built the site? Was it built in-house or was it built from a third-party vendor? I've seen in the past um, sites that are built by third-party vendors but then maintained by the target company itself. Sometimes doing recon on those third-party vendors can be fruitful. Of course, we can always look at uh, GitHub, Stack Overflow and other websites which could contain information that could help in finding bugs in InScope targets. One more thing to look at is see if the app integrates with other apps like Slack, GitHub, Jira, Microsoft Teams, and so on and so forth. Sometimes applications trust data coming in from those integrations, so it can result in interesting bugs. The first bug I'm going to talk about is an RC which I got from doing recon on a third-party vendor. The second bug um, is about using third-party applications like Slack and Teams, which have resulted in privilege escalations and information disclosures. The third bug is about an XSS I got by chaining a few vulnerabilities together. At one point, I was stuck and Anaquin exploited as I needed a reflected XSS on any subdomain of the target I was hacking. Since not all domains were in scope, I got in touch with the program in order to ask them if they'd be okay for me to look for an XSS on autoscope assets in order to complete my chain. Since the end result was, uh, was a high impact bug on their main application, they gladly accepted it so that I went on and looked for an XSS, an XSS which I eventually got to finally complete my chain of bugs. The last couple of bugs is about how I was able to get an IDOR a Privesk and an RCE by posting links in an application. I get access to sensitive data through the referer header or have an admin um, exploit something for me. We'll see later what I mean by this. I don't consider social engineering or phishing, which is out of scope, as I'm not actually sending anyone a malicious email or anything. I'm using the application as it's intended. I'm simply posting a link and if a user or admin clicks on it, well, good for me. It's a bit similar to how a blind, blind access would work. You can't really trigger it yourself, you need to wait for some, user, some sort of user interaction. While browsing around the application, I noticed an odd domain in the content security policy. This domain didn't belong to the target company. I did some recon to try to find out why it's in the CSP and how they were related to each other. It turned out that this company was a vendor that built applications for the, for the company I was hacking on. I continued doing recon and ended up finding an interesting PDF file by simply doing a Google dork. 
The file contained instructions on how to install and configure WordPress, and of course it had credentials in it. But the app I was looking at was actually built on AEM. By default, AEM accepts uh, basic authentication outside endpoints. I figured, what are the odds that they use the same creds for the sites that they build on WordPress and on Adobe Experience Manager, and, the, and that those creds were actually still valid? Well, of course, you guessed it. Um, it worked, and they also had admin rights. In AEM, once you have admin rights, it's really easy to get an RCE. You, can, you simply need to upload a bundle. I think luck was a huge part of this bug, but it does show that sometimes looking elsewhere can result in impactful bugs. And also shout out to uh, Mikhail, aka uh, Zero Angel, for that um, malicious bundle. With this second bug, as I mentioned earlier, I try to approach web applications in a way that no other hackers have. What I've been doing recently is using products like Slack and Teams. These products have apps that allow you to interact directly with target applications, and many of those apps actually have bug bounty programs, as we can see in this screenshot. I won't expand too much on these bugs as each Slack or Teams app is different and they all have a different purpose. For example, some are only used to read data or for webhooks, while others you can create and update data on the target application. You practically only have to use the target's app on Slack or Teams and try to find bugs that way. As an example with Slack, I focused on apps that had the option to create data through commands. By running these commands, I was able to do stuff that normally I wasn't able to uh, directly on the web app. I've never really built, I've never actually built a Slack app, so I'm not really exactly sure what the root cause would be. I'm guessing it maybe uses different APIs, which probably don't have the same protections in place as their normal or the, from the API or the web app. If anyone of you listening knows why, um, please DM me. I'm definitely curious about it. So with my third bug, um, only the main application was in scope. I had a cookie-based XSS, which of course is a self-XSS. I also noticed that all API calls were done on a separate subdomain, but Cores was configured to allow all subdomains to interact with it. Which meant that if I could make this XSS be a valid XSS, I'd be able to leak data from the API. However, I didn't find a way to do so. I couldn't find any XSS on the Inscope application at all. I knew that if I could find XSS on a separate subdomain, that my chain would work as it would fill in all my requirements. At this point, I simply asked the program if I could look at look for an XSS on a separate subdomain. Uh, luckily for me, they accepted. Um, and a few hours later, uh, I finally found an XSS and was able to complete my chain and leak uh, data from the um, API. So here's the attack. With the reflected XSS on an autoscope domain, I redirected the user to the vulnerable endpoint where the cookie-based XSS was located. I used cookie stuffing to my malicious cookie containing my XSS payload to exploit the core's misconfig. As per the HTTP state management mechanism, RFC, uh, the cookies with the longer path are listed before the ones with the shorter path. Luckily for me, the cookie set by the server didn't actually have a path, so I could simply set anything as a path. And my cookie would be the one reflected on the, web, on the web page instead of the one set by the server. And for this, a uh, shout out to File Descriptor for this trick. I learned that from him at uh, H1514 uh, two years ago. Uh, so now with my cookie-based XSS, I was able to make uh, an XML HTTP request to the API host and leak PI PII data. I was able to complete this chain all because that the program allowed me to look for uh, reflected XSS on Anoscope assets. So lesson to learn here is, if you need a bug on an Anoscope asset to complete your chain, uh, always ask permission first. So we're now down to the last round of bugs. Uh, in the first example, I was looking at an application that was kind of like a forum. Uh, users could post content and others uh, would be able to view it and reply, reply to it. Uh, UUID version 4 was used pretty much everywhere, so on post IDs, user IDs, uh, reply IDs, pretty much everywhere I uh, had a UUID. While testing with my own two accounts, um, I was able to confirm that multiple endpoints were vulnerable to IDOR, and one in particular uh, had PII, so obviously I was very interested in this one. However, as we know, uh, we can't just brute force or guess UIDs, uh, so it wasn't really exploitable at this point. And also I didn't find a way to link them anywhere on the site. Uh, when viewing our own profile, uh, we could see posts that we had posted on the, on the forum, and all updates that uh, users had put in it as well. And in our profile, when uh, the URL actually contained our own UID. So what I did was reply on someone else's post with a link to my site. And then when users uh, were on their profile um, and saw my post and clicked on my link, 
their UUID would, click, would leak in the referer header. So I could simply look at my logs and grab their UUID. Uh, from here, I was, able, I was easily able to confirm the IDOR and submit a report. Um, however, the program at first didn't accept it as I only got one user to click on my site. However, an hour later, um, I was able to get five more UIDs, which was enough for the program to accept my report and reward uh, accordingly. Another example bug which had information leaking in the referer header was a privilege escalation which got me into an admin panel. Uh, the app didn't have proper authorization checks in place. Uh, Read-only users were able to escalate privileges and write content to the site. Uh, so this made me wonder whether uh, the admin panel was configured in the same way. But the thing is, um, I, we didn't know the path to the admin panel. Uh, I tried directory brute forcing to find it. I put a few blind access payloads in uh, strate strategic places, like uh, the contact us form and stuff like that, but none of it worked. Um, so then I thought, what if I just send a link in the contact us form? And yeah, as you imagine, an admin saw it, clicked on my link, and uh, the admin endpoint uh, path was leaked in the refer header. And indeed, um, this gave me access to the admin panel directly. Um, the path was quite random. Uh, it would have probably taken me f quite a, f a, long, a long time, let's say, uh, to guess or brute force. In this last example bug, uh, where I posted a link somewhere, um, this one isn't about a referer leak like the previous two. Uh, it's something a bit different. Uh, I've been doing uh, this for for a while now, and I had some success with it, so I figured I could share it. Uh, to me, it's like the advanced version of, of blind success. Uh, instead of popping a blind success in the main panel, uh, why not have uh, an admin or an employee pop a shell for you? Uh, so here's how I got an RC on an internal asset. So this web application uh, had quite a few features that required admin approval, uh, with the admins being actual employees. Uh, while doing recon on GitHub, I found an internal Jenkins subdomain uh, like jenkins.internal.domain.com. So I was curious to see if this uh, server was vulnerable to the RCEs that uh, Orange found, um, I think it was last year. Uh, from my own ex personal experience, um, companies don't always pass their internal assets uh, since they believe that they're secure uh, since it's internal. Uh, but of course, uh, this, as we know, isn't true. Um, unfortunately though, I didn't find any way to get access to it. Uh, I didn't find any SSRF or anything. So I was able to validate um, my curiosity. Um, then I thought, what if the admins uh, do have access to it? Like if they're on VPN or just like in the office, maybe they have access to Jenkins. Uh, but how would I confirm this? Um, so what I did is sent an, uh, an access request, which of course required admin approval. In the request, I put a link to my site. Uh, now the link that I put in the, in the access request it wasn't the actual Jenkins uh, URL. I figured that if the admin saw that, he would have been like, um, how does this guy know we have Jenkins? Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna click on it. This is weird, it's fishy. I'll just ignore it. So what I did is put a link to my site, uh, which actually redirected them to the uh, Jenkins RC pay, uh, URL that he put. Um, and since I, I was able to view the response, obviously, uh, the RC payload that I put was a reverse shell that would connect back, connect back to my server. And uh, a few hours after I sent the request, I got a hit on my server with the endpoint that I put for that specific POC. And then right away, uh, I got a connection back from the Jenkins uh, server, confirming that it was indeed vulnerable. Um, so this is something I've been doing for the past year or so. Uh, it takes a lot of recon on subdomains. Uh, some subdomains don't resolve publicly. Um, doesn't mean that it doesn't resolve internally, and also it doesn't mean that um, it doesn't exist. So with this little trick, as I've shown, it's possible to exploit bugs on internal assets. Um, so using this technique, I've got, uh, got a few RCEs and some reflected XSS. Um, since it's completely blind, um, since you're not actually the one attacking the site, you kind of need to have a way of um, communicating back to, your, to yourself uh, out of band. Um, so with RCEs and XSS, of course, it's possible. Um, there might be some more bugs that I'm not think of, thinking of, maybe like XSC, XXE, but uh, yeah, it's something I, I will probably have to research more on. Um, so yeah, I hope uh, you like my talk. Uh, thanks, thank you a lot for listening. If you have any questions or comments, uh, my DMs are open on Twitter. 
So I don't hesitate to reach out, uh, reply as soon as possible. Thanks again.